Okay, welcome everyone to the last session of the day. Nice to see so many people after partying last night. <laughs> Not sure when everyone got back, but uh, yeah, this is always the hardest session of the conference, I think. So this this uh, stream is says applications miscellaneous, but obviously each talk is definitely not miscellaneous. I think they're all very important. So um, yeah, um, the first speaker for today, uh, I'm started a bit early because I thought I would take longer, but uh, walk up slowly, Ruan. <laughs> <laughs> so you start at nine. <laughs> um, is Ruan Lees uh, from Elitica. And Ruan has a, um, holds a master's in computer engineering and a PhD in industrial engineering. He is the author of a mathematical modeling language and an active contributor to open source operations research projects. So we'll have to talk about which open resource projects those are, Ruan. Um, for those of you that were at the tutorial, um, you would have already met Ron. He was helping out with Fani at the first tutorial session. And yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, you, you can slowly make your way here. <laughs> <laughs> so before I start, the open source projects, it's uh, HISE and CBC. <laughs> well, CLP as well, a bit. But it's more like uh, me fixing bugs that I detect when implementing their stuff. So, <laughs> and then just opening pull up pull requests and yeah, see so, see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, towards optimal route planning for solar powered battery electric vehicles, it's a uh, planning for EVs, but with a solar panel attached. That's the, the main thing. There's a lot of complexity that comes with it. So. Yeah, but the normal battery electric vehicle route planning obviously have range anxiety and uh, yeah, so I'm just going to go through how I actually approach the, the model and implemented it and give some mathematics yeah, and talk about uh, what we'll do in the future. So the, the when you only look at the uh, PV battery electric vehicle, you don't really have this problem like uh, the weather is not not really a factor so you don't <laughs> you don't really care about it so the planning is a lot easier than when you attach a solar panel and you actually need to consider uh, when you get more energy it's not a lot maybe 10 percent on your total trip but it's still something so when you model it it, it comes a bit more difficult so yeah this this is just a weird illustration sometimes if you actually drive faster you can drive under the weather out and it is advantageous. So, so <laughs> yeah, uh, just a just a, a warning. This is not going to be a very long presentation. <laughs> so uh, usually I talk very fast, and uh, yeah, maybe some interactive type of uh, presentation. Well, I, I'd appreciate that. So <laughs> it, that's also fun. <laughs> uh, but but mo most of the, the presentation is it's slides or uh, pictures and mathematics. There's no there's nothing else. So <laughs> just just the heads up. <laughs> so the way I, I modeled the, obviously the the roots is all with graph and each each arc well it's presented as a segment but has some um, metadata associated with it. So it's well the slope of of the road and the distance of the road, uh, basic metadata for the, the GIS type of stuff. But yeah, that's associated with each arc. So this is just this is before modeling the actual car. This is just plain data set, and uh, this is how the data set looks. This is with the me metadata associated with with it. Uh, and obviously, when you you actually uh, define the route. There's all, all kinds of different small stuff that that you don't uh, realize at first. Like the elevation is not obviously the same everywhere. So the slope is different. So the, the granularity of the data set matters a lot. So there's a, there's a thing that you need to determine where, where do you actually put nodes? And uh, well, the obvious 
thing you can do is put it on the saddle points. It, it's it's an approach. You lose some some uh, uh, well distance, but yeah, at least at least you get something. But you can uh, divide it up in in even smaller parts. Data sets get larger. The problem gets uh, harder to solve, but it's more accurate. And uh, yeah, here's just the the, the first attempt was solving. I'll just show the spot, but I think in in this audience, most of us actually know how to do that, uh, path-based or, or flow conservation model. And uh, the extra thing we need to consider is is the velocity. So velocity, uh, well, the velocity and the duration uh, relationship, it's not linear, so you need to linearize it. And when you're minimizing time and the, the velocity is dynamic, yeah, you just linearize it. So this is just a small uh, example of, of the shortest path. If you want to know more about the actual actual data set and everything surrounding it, it's in my PhD as well. So the flow conservation model, yeah, we all know sum of everything out is equal to sum of everything in, except for the source and destination. Yeah, I, I really don't think I need to go into to too much detail here. M most of you have seen this. <laughs> so yeah, and also the the time constraints. Yeah, it's just uh, when you activate when you're uh, flowing through a certain node, you activate the time constraints or you disable them with a big M. And uh, yeah, this is just the linearization part for for the velocity. So it's basic convexity constraints. Velocity taking the tau is uh, the duration, uh, v va is the velocity on an arc, and you just linearize it. So this this is the first first part of the the model. So this is the flow conservation part, and well, I'm I just did it with the path space as well, so I can compare the two and, and see the differences in actual model implementation. So it's the same same idea, just. Instead of using flows, you're predefining all the paths, and yeah, you select the path. So decision variable for selecting a certain path. But there's a lot of more pre-processing going on for the, the path-based model because you need to determine all the different route, or all the different paths from the source to the destination to actually populate the, the model. So this is just a continuation of the path-based model. Also, yeah, just convexity constraints for. For the linearization, uh, well, this is for each segment, but it's yeah, so the same idea, exactly the same idea. So the next, the next part. So this model, everything up to here, is just the shortest path, basically, with some linearization constraints. So the next part is to actually model the, the uh, battery electric vehicle, well, the physics of it. So we did basic just velocity, and when we drive a surgeon spin, we know how long it will take. The next thing is, well, let's let's do some physics and uh, actually model it. Here, here's just a, some a, a quick proof that I actually uh, simulated it and and model it completely. And uh, then after that, you can start to add energy to energy constraints. Into the model, given given the characteristics of the vehicle and and everything surrounding that, so at each point the battery has a certain capacity and it shouldn't go under a certain capacity, which is uh, epsilon low, because then the battery gets damaged and and all those type of stuff. So yeah, so this is once again you can you can see this is going to be linearized, and you can do this without caring too much now about uh, when you start. So you know you're not considering the solar panel yet. So you can start any time. The energy going out you know, out of the battery it doesn't matter when you start. You're not considering the solar panel yet. So this is well, this is for the path-based model, the constraints that are added. And you can see at each step, you're just uh, getting the previous segments as uh, energy usage and and uh, keeping track of it on constraint 41 and this is the same for the 
the path of the flow conservation model. But because you're working with flows, you don't want to uh, well keep track of of flows that that's not activated. So that's just another big M constraint. I know big M's are ugly. That's what is a path based anti flow conservation model. Uh, but yeah, the, the big M constraint just allows you to only count the energy that's that's actually activated. And uh, yeah, now the next part is is considering this the well, this, the wind and the solar and, and all those types of stuff. So now it, it depends when you start on a segment. Because if you start later in the day, let's say 12 o'clock, now, well, you're going to have more sun than when you start at, at the beginning of the day or even 5 o'clock in the, the afternoon. You're going to have less sun. So, yeah, this is this is actually also, well, everything is, is from my PhD. So if, if you have any questions, you can ask now, or you can just go read, read a PhD. It's, <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I modeled the, the irradiation and everything of that. But uh, yeah, so th there's a lot of work that people have done with this, so it was quite easy to to actually just get uh, input from from other uh, other systems for this. And uh, yeah, th this is just more fun. Color book pictures that uh, I probably forgot every last detail, but as I said, it's in my PhD, <laughs> and uh, I think I go in uh, yeah, a lot of detail in it. So it's just modeling the the radiation, and also, well, uh, some of the radiation that gets reflected off the the clouds, and, and at the end, it is the diffuse radiation. So. All of that is considered in the model, but this, a solar panel actually cares about what's going in. Uh, so more the direct irradiation is, is more important. And uh, yeah, now actually modeling modeling those weird weird uh, time dependent uh, energy well energy gains. Uh, you have a you have an energy graph, and on that energy graph is when you start the start time on, on a segment and at what speed you drive and what yeah the energy you gained or used is on the, the well z axis so this is one way of dividing up the data is in triangles it's it's way more accurate to do it this way but when you do this yeah well you're going to have to put a lot of uh, new constraints in to actually model the, the triangle part so the alternative is to to follow a block block uh, approach instead of uh, linearizing everything with uh, with a convex combination like in the triangle convex combination of the triangle you can just uh, split it up into blocks this is way more or way faster but you have a disadvantage with the with the accuracy so this is how it actually looks if you if you plot some of the data, and then you'll see yeah there's a difference, but it depends on how much computational effort you you spend on on the right hand side. If it's too much, the left hand side is actually enough. So this is for the uh, the triangle method. So once again, it's just a convex combination that you you care about, and you divide while well, you create uh, binary decision variables variables to to model the triangles. And this last constraint just makes sure that, well, if you actually choose a triangle that it uses the, the, the correct points for the convex combination. And the same for, well, this is the block model. So instead of having the convex combination like in the previous slides, uh, you can, yeah, to a great degree, uh, cheat a bit and uh, divide the the start times in, in actually into blocks. So this is computationally way less effort. But as I said, you have a, a penalty, a accuracy penalty. So this also works, the triangle with it also works for the flow conservation. Same instead of segments, we're just using arcs. And yeah, basically the same constraints. But in this case, if you have a flow, you actually care about uh, the convex combination. So if you don't have a flow, you can just make everything zero. 
So the block method is same as, as for the path-based one. And also the flow determines if you actually want to, to activate the, the uh, linearization or not. And then here are some results regarding the two different methods. Well, two different models with the two different methods. And you can see the block models, yeah, they're they're quite more efficient than than the triangle method. And the error is it's a bit lower for the uh, triangle method, but I mean you can see both are still yeah, it more it depends more on the number of uh, points you actually have w w that you use for linearization than the actual method. So maybe just put more points in the, the block method and yeah, to, to compensate for the accuracy. And yeah, there there are a few data sets that uh, I use to generate results. And all of the results are actually in my PhD, but it's, it's really a lot. So I just uh, gave some snapshots here. And yeah, you can you can see. Okay, so before I go on, uh, why did I actually do a flow conservation and a path-based model? Why not one of the two? In, uh, well, except for the the nice comparison you can make, is uh, the path-based model is easily transformed into a heuristic by limiting the number of paths. You can do the shortest path or k shortest path, and then you have a heuristic. It's way faster, and that's why there's a, a FK1 and uh, or K1. That's just when a heuristic was actually used um, with the, the the flow conservation or pathways model as a warm start. So, yeah, and this is just a, another small data set. And yeah, yeah. Well, I'd rather have you ask questions. So, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Yes. Uh, what's it? One degree every four minutes or something mm -hmm. like that. And roads don't really have that much elevation. Like a four degree slope on a road is quite significant. So uh, it seems like a lot of effort uh, mm -hmm. modeling the angle of the road. Yeah. So the effort is because it's not only the, the angle on the panel when you drive up or down. It's also, yeah. That the kind amount of, of energy and... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the initial thing was more about the solar races. So they actually have a solar panel and the panel can tilt as well. So all of those small types of things, yeah, it adds to the, to the problem. The, also the complexity, but <laughs> yeah, you're correct. At at some point, you need to determine. Nah, okay, this is too much effort for yeah for for the small gains we can get. Yeah. Thanks for a nice talk. Is are there any other questions? Because if they aren't, you're going to have to read Ruan's PhD. <laughs> <laughs> it might be easier to ask questions now. <laughs> So if you have a vehicle and it's driving, you can surely I measure, measure the outgoing wattage from the, you know, from the battery. Did you? So in a sense, the model should be calibratable. Did you calibrate it? Um, in, in what? Well, that's the first question. If you did, how did it confirm your results? Yes. <laughs> but uh, I think I shouldn't say too much about it. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the solar race is ongoing now, and we actually confirmed the results for the first uh, two days already. Well, then we came to the conference and we didn't really <laughs> made anything else. But yeah, the results, they, they, they actually confirm that what, what a model says is actually what, what's happening, which is nice. <laughs> yes, thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Um, so I don't know if you've looked um, into the literature regarding road elevations with uh, heavy haul vehicles. So <clears throat> this problem of uh, modeling the movement through a network on um, uh, heavy angles or trying to minimize the amount of angle. 
is um, a, a really big problem for big trucks because your gearboxes undergo a lot of strain and often you're trying to find a path that reduces your brake wear and your gearbox wear because that costs you more than the fuel that it would otherwise cost to avoid it. Um, and they use a similar set of techniques, but obviously not with all the um, the limelight of solar, right? Because it's a dirty old business. Did you look at that at all? Um, not in that much detail, but for the solar, well, you can have some constraints that say, whoa, okay, if the elevation is too much, just <laughs> avoid it in total. But yeah, the, the solar cars actually have the same problem. If the elevation is too, too much, yeah, the torque you can give for a certain, especially when the battery is already drained, you can, at some, some elevations, you cannot go up. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so maybe a, a way is to have everything like this and then just, yeah, constrain, constrain where you can go. But I, I didn't go into too much detail, especially for, for trucks or <laughs> anything like that. Yeah. Um, there was a, um, there was a solar vehicle competition recently, right? Yeah. Did you, were you involved with that in the planning of that or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I must say there, there are some human components that that you can't avoid. <laughs> Is that the soft OR part? That's the soft OR part, yeah. You, you, can, you can make suggestions, but if they follow it, that's, that's up to them. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Any more questions? I was going to make a point that I thought I saw an error in constraint number 68. That's, um, that's, no, uh, <laughs> that's very likely. <laughs> you see, I was uh, quite tired last night when I, when I, when I created it. <laughs> okay. I'm not too worried now. No, I'm, I'm joking, Ron. <laughs> oh. No, no, no. Well, uh, I did this slides last night 12 o'clock around there <laughs> so <laughs> there's a great chance that there are a few areas not only one <laughs> so okay <laughs> uh, um, okay. and just one question on the data sets what who how are they being compiled what are they uh, well i compile them i try to oh, vary okay. it as much as possible but yeah okay. it's a bunch of data sets i created so okay great thanks is is that all Super. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Okay. That's very good. good. Okay, everyone, we're going to start the next talk. So our next speaker is Ibrahim Stienkamp, and he's going to be talking on examination timetabling at the University of Cape Town a taboo search approach to automation. And Ibrahim is a consultant for the statistical consulting unit at the University of Cape Town. And while the work spans many different fields, his current interests lie in operations research with a focus on automation. So Ibrahim, you're at the right place. <laughs> Thank you, uh, David, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I am presenting the work I did during my master's dissertation at obviously the University of Cape Town um, and my supervisor was Georgina. Um, I'm sure many of you have had a chance to meet it during the span of the conference. Um, so examination timetabling is a recurring issue at the university um, and it's more so um, a symptom of kind of their systems or their philosophies uh, as opposed to something that kind of can be changed. So we need to rather focus on tackling, you know, the solution approach as to the um, the causes of the problem, I guess, which in this case would just be students registering. You obviously don't want to tackle that in the sense of reducing the students, right? Um, so if we look at the life cycle, kind of the examination timetabling, what you have is you have the students that would register at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the semester. Um, when they register for a degree, they have core modules, which are obviously the modules they have to do as part of their degree. Um, certain degrees allow for electives out of kind of a set of, of courses. And then um, there's also electives in the sense of as long as you meet the prerequisites for these courses um, and the, the lecture times of those courses don't clash with any of your other lecture times, you can you know register for those courses. So as someone that's kind of in statistics, 
if I wanted to, you know, sit into a marine biology course, uh, you know, as long as there aren't any clashes, I'm more than welcome to do so. Um, and then between kind of that time and where the actual timetabling starts, you have late registrations, you know, students changing their minds and, you know, kind of dropouts for, for various reasons. Um, once that's all kind of completed, you, uh, the examinations offered, so which are the people responsible for the timetabling, can actually start on the exam timetabling. So what they'll do is they'll create a provisional timetable um, based on the information they have and kind of just release it to the students and staff and have an opportunity for feedback. So this timetable isn't necessarily void of clashes, right? So it's uh, sometimes on the onus of the students to look and see like, OK, um, there's clearly I have an issue here and I'll notify the examinations office. Um, whereas for staff, it might be more um, pressing. Um, I think more obvious, matter, oh, maybe not obvious, but um, things that the examination office wouldn't know in the sense of maybe they aren't available on certain days where the exams are scheduled and therefore they would prefer if, you know, an exam can be moved if, if the timetable allows. Um, then given these, this feedback, they release, you know, they create a new timetable if, if needed and then release that again, get additional feedback and then release the final timetable. So they do this in kind of three phases, as you can see, you know, creating three different uh, timetables and each phase takes roughly two weeks, you know, to kind of create a timetable, release it and allow adequate time for feedback. Um, so in terms of looking at an approach, I'm focusing on something that's uh, easily flexible in the sense of, you know, if we need to introduce additional constraints to the problem uh, based on the feedback and something that um, maybe can, you know, work continuously in the sense that the the solution doesn't always just break down completely, you know, as we change the problem. Um, but I'll get a bit more into that later. So the actual data uh, that I was able to receive from the examinations office was for the 2014 um, November examination period. Um, we just chose this because we wanted something pre COVID and obviously the the uh, the further beyond uh, that it doesn't make sense, but the further beyond the data, kind of the less problems you have because you know that all these students kind of left the university by now. Um, so that's kind of the, the point. Um, so I received three data sets. The first data set had to do with the venues. So we're looking at what venues are available when you know in scheduling um, and their capacities. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't really able to make use of this data set um, for various reasons. The first reason being that the data contained duplicates. So there are name changes that take place at the university. I think the, the most obvious one is what is now called Sierra Department, used to be called, you know, the Chambers and all. Um, so you obviously can't have both those venues in your data set because one of the venues technically technically don't exist anymore. And then they have what um, what I've called um, at least catch all venues. So they'll, they'll say that a certain exams will be scheduled by the department and the capacity of that venue is a thousand. So that doesn't necessarily mean that that exam requires a seating of a thousand. It just means that it's on the onus of that department to kind of seat them in the in their, their venues that they use for their lectures and whatnot. Um, and then I've also called uh, special venues that they haven't made any indication in terms of computer labs or medical labs or any other labs in terms of what what venue um, is used for what. Right. So if a um, <coughs> excuse me if a, if an exam required a computer lab, I wouldn't know you know, which venues are actually computer labs. Okay, unless it obviously says computer lab in the title, but that's a bit um, on the nose, I guess. Um, and then the second set of uh, data was had to do with the courses. So each row entry in this data would be, for example, uh, a student, what course they took, um, maybe some information on their course, and then whether or not they had um, special needs. Special needs here are described as things like um, if a student um, is unable to to write, um, they might need a scribe or they might need the use of a computer or something like that. And the more common special need um, is extra time, uh, which is just defined as the, the number of extra minutes um, a student is allowed per hour exam. So if I'm allowed 10 minutes extra time and the exam is two hours, uh, two hours long, then I would be allocated a time of two hours and 20 minutes. Um, I think that's fairly straightforward. And then the last, um, data set was the provisional solution that they actually had for the 2014 November um, exam timetable. Um, normally, I wouldn't, you know, want to use this data set in kind of setting up the problem. You know, this is something you just kind of look at 
after you've gotten your results for competitive sake. Um, but unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, it had quite useful information in the sense of what exams had what assessments, I mean, or what courses had what assessments, excuse me. Um, so uh, stats one exam, a stats one course might have one exam, but a stats two course might have two exams. And that's, you know, something I, I wouldn't know before. And so, you know, you'd have to be uh, notified and that's where I found the, the information for that. It also had exam durations, you know, that's kind of an obvious one. If you schedule exams, you need to know how long they are and then venue requirements. So this is again another reason why I couldn't actually do venue allocation in this specific problem, um, because if we look at, you know, a, a large exam might be an online exam. So does that mean, you know, I need to book it in a computer lab, but I don't actually know which labs or which venues are computer labs or which uh, courses require um, take home exams. You know, that's not something you would uh, actually schedule because then you wouldn't have kind of a venue allocation problem. All right. So based on that, we get the recorded uh, reality, I guess, which I, which I'll call it, you know, what what problem can we actually create from from the data available um, after data cleaning? I had you know just uh, just under sixteen thousand unique students and just under sixteen six hundred uh, unique exams. So this was about uh, sixty thousand kind of entries if we think of kind of an Excel file or when all the data was merged. And then I'm looking at two hundred and seventy six starting times. Um, so the November examination period spanned over fifteen days, and we have. Exams are scheduled between, you know, eight o'clock and five. Oh, scheduled to start, excuse me, at eight o'clock and or five o'clock, and each half an hour between between Monday and Thursday and eight o'clock and half past three on a Friday. So, kind of, if we if we append all those starting times, we get two hundred and seventy six starting times. All right. So, what um, made this problem uh, perhaps a bit more complex as opposed to some of the uh, problems, at least in um, literature is that they are very different starting um, durations of some exams. You know, some people are quite uh, lucky, I guess, to be at the university where the exams only need to be scheduled like two hours or four hours, whereas um, at least for this data, exams range between half an hour all the way up to 12 hours. So kind of very different, you know, durations. Um, and I decided to approach this on a student level basis or uh, scheduling from a student level. So that means when I'm looking at clashes or, or any other of my other costs, I would look at for a specific student and their set of courses that they take, you know, how does the solution look like for them? And then how does it then look then look for all students? Right. And I've just given kind of some illustration of what the um, what the solution would look like. So we so we have these 276 starting times, right? And we have our 598 exams. Um, and we kind of trying to allocate some number between one and two, uh, 276, you know, for each of the 598. So it's, it's, it's a fairly simple um, way of the defining a solution uh, in this case. Um, and the way in which I decided to evaluate the solution was to have these two costs, um, which I just called conflict costs and proximity costs. Conflict costs is just kind of checking, you know, whether or not there are clashes. So that's, you know, an integer value that's fairly simple. And we know the lower bound of zero. Um, you know, if it exists, of course, um, which we hope. Um, and then we have a proximity cost, which is just some type of way of finding the quality of a timetable. Um, I define this as the distance between successive exams for each student. So as a student, you'd obviously want, you know, your two exams to be as far apart as possible. So we're trying to maximize that distance. Um, and then this is kind of how I decided to join these two costs in, in terms of some total cost. Um, this value of C is just some multiplier to ensure that the conflict cost is always prioritized by the by the optimizer. Um, so the you can see that the value of C is actually the maximum value obtained by the proximity cost. Uh, and the way in which I found this is obviously the the worst possible scheduling is just when you have all possible uh, exams at the same time on the same day. Um, so I think that was fairly obvious um, to, to calculate in, in, in my case. So I'm happy for that. Um, you can see if we look at when weighting them equally, there's a slight kink in this um, red line or, or pink line, whichever, depending on your, your level of color blindness, um, I guess. Um, it shows that you know, when weighted equally, unfortunately, the um, an optimizer would end up 
possibly preferring uh, proximity as opposed to conflict, which means that you would kind of potentially introduce clashes for the sake of having a better spread in exams. And that's from a practical perspective, that's obviously not useful at all. So um, the blue line kind of just shows, you know, monot uh, monotonically decreasing, which is exactly what we want. Um, and then we'd only kind of look at the proximity cost once uh, the uh, conflict cost has actually reached zero. So that was the, the idea behind this. Um, the, <coughs> the algorithm I decided to use was table search. Like I said, um, based on the way in which the problem is defined, it, we want a solution process is that, that's flexible and easy to implement, and materialistics are quite good at that. Um, my definition in this case of, of table search is maybe not the, the most generic. I made things easier for myself, um, just because I guess I like to do things easily. Um, so um, all materialistics right need an initial solution. And then what I had was, you know, you have to, I sampled a neighbors as opposed to, you know, checking all possible neighbors. Um, and the neighborhoods I decided was were the three these three neighborhoods, which I just named random, swapped and changed. So for a random neighborhood, you would have all possible neighbors or all possible solutions. Um, so that's maybe not the most useful, but we'll see why that was necessary. Um, we'll have a swap neighborhood. So if we just take two um, two values in the um, the the vector and we kind of just swap them, you know, whatever whatever um, starting times they had, we just swap them. Um, so that's simple. And then the change is we'll take one of the the values in the in the vector and we'll change them to any of the other possible starting times. Um, and then, you know, like I said here, I've I decided to use no aspiration criteria. So I built the um, the table list into the the sampling of the neighbor the neighbors. So only permissible neighbors were allowed to be sampled. Um, again, that's just to make things easier for myself. Um, and then we do you know evaluate, update, um, and con uh, continue the iteration into, until you reach some stopping criteria. Um, the stopping criteria I chose was uh, a time limit, right? In in hours or in minutes or in seconds or whatever. And the reason for that is just because it's a lot. Um, more intuitive, you know, what two hours means for these end users that would that I essentially created, you know, this problem for, right? It's not for myself. I don't see myself scheduling like on a day-to-day -day basis. So I've tried to kind of remove any 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 need for myself in, in the algorithm as far as possible. Um, and then they can, you know, if they're going on break anyways and you you know your break's an hour long, you can just run the algorithm for an hour and just see what you you get after. So this is just um, a very quick and dirty, I guess, um, sensitivity analysis into which neighborhoods to use um, and when. Um, so we can see that uh, above, I think that's about 2,500 uh, clashes or, or, con or conflict cost of 2,500. Um, the random neighborhood actually ends up being the best neighborhood in terms of minimizing the the problem, and then from the uh, you could argue that the swap neighborhood is the best until maybe a value of six hundred, and then the change neighborhood should be used. In my case, I decided to <clears throat> use the random neighborhood until two thousand five hundred, and then just switch directly into the change neighborhood. My reasoning for this is that the swap neighborhood necessarily introduces a local minimum. Um, so, you know, I think since there aren't that big differences between the gradients, I decided, you know, we'll just go straight into straight into the um, the change neighborhood. Um, if we look at some of the results, so this results over here are specifically for the, the two hours uh, that I ran the, the, time, um, the algorithm for, but I did test it on half an hour and an hour. Um, so I just say five rounds to get an idea of what the average, um, uh, I guess, optimizing the average optimizer would look like. Um, uh, sorry, the, the average ability of the optimizer would look like. Um, and then I use a random initial solution. In practice, this would be maybe the previous years or the previous semester's um, timetable, or even just uh, using a maximal click heuristic to kind of get a, a base kind of initial initial um, solution. And then I use the table list length of 50, and I sampled five neighbors again, just some idea of the values. It doesn't necessarily have to be optimal in this case. Um, you can see that the initial um, 
solution values are very different. Obviously, as expected, it's all random. Um, but the starting time points are kind of all within a similar range, which I guess is a positive thing. Um, and the best run out of these five rounds actually reached a 27 clashes. So to put that in context, the provisional timetable had uh, 307 clashes. So if the examinations office took anything longer than you know two hours to create that solution, I've already showed that you know it, it's worthwhile to to kind of look at this. Um, and then I just kind of packaged it all into an app. This is again just because you don't expect um, these people to be able to you know code right or you know have any award experience. Um, again, just removing myself from the from the equation as far as possible. And then I, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet with them and kind of present my results. They said they had looked into automation before, but um, it was kind of pushed back further and further in terms of more important um, things that they needed to do since they are able to obviously schedule manually um, as they do now. Um, and they are interested in the results, just obviously not in the current form because like I said, the recorded reality is a lot different from the actual reality in this case. And if you know I'm able to, I guess, scale it up to to that case, then they would definitely be looking into adopting it, uh, especially as a, for the moment, a kind of improvement tool. Um, so they will create the 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 solution and then see whether or not it can be improved. And I guess maybe through doing that, they perhaps gain a bit more trust in in it, and then therefore just um, kind of maybe adopt it in. In later strategies and then uh you know what else like i said there's quite a lot to do because it's not uh the greatest at the moment you know but it is a starting point and i guess that was definitely the the, the intention you know just to see whether or not um this can be done with my current set of skills and then uh move it further into a phd topic which is hopefully the the goal and then you know, in the ideal case, it would be integrated um, into the current UCT systems so that, you know, for example, when we need to pull the data, you can pull it straight from the servers and then data cleaning can happen like that because the data structures are unlikely to change right from year on year. Um, so the, the I guess the, the app especially would then, you know, be have constant use th uh, throughout time. Um, thank you. Great, thanks, Ibra. I mean, the timetabling is challenging because you would think that, like in Newton's time, they would have had timetabling problems, and he chose to invent calculus sure. rather. But he was probably also waiting for the computer to arrive. So, um, are there any questions? I'm sure there must be questions. Everyone suffers from timetabling problems. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating to know how they actually do it manually. Yeah. I mean, do they take last year's and just tweak it? So what they have is they actually do use soft, they actually do use software, but um, it's more just to do the timetabling visually, right? Because you can drag and drop um, exams. Um, how exactly they start off, I'm not entirely sure. I would assume they just have kind of a base template, um, which should like I say, you know, should be good enough as an initial starting solution. And as long as there aren't too many changes year on year with students, um, they can kind of just use intuition maybe to kind of get to a solution. But you know, the, the idea is obviously is the timetable the best it can be. I guess is is what the hope is from from the research. Any other questions? No. You can see I've struggled with timetable. <laughs> um, so they eventually, through their manual tweaking, do get to a timetable with no clashes. I um, would hope so. Um, I, yeah, I'm kind of just assuming here, right? Um, yeah. There are cases where clashes are allowed, um, and then, um, but this kind of relates to when did the student register for this course? Were they actually supposed to yeah. be registered for the course in terms of, uh, you know, was the person checking or signing off actually kind of doing the job correctly? I think that's kind of things get a little muddy when we get to kind of that that point. Um, but some of the onus does fall on the student themselves when there are clashes and they do have kind of cases lined out. But obviously I couldn't look at it just based on the lack of data. 
available. So anomalous students actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So okay. th it's Thanks. not necessarily that there is a, a minimum in this specific data set. There was a minimum. Um, um, I didn't really touch on it, but uh, I think if I just go to one of the previous slides. Uh, yeah, so I ran the I ran an optimizer for just over two days and I did actually get the timetable that had no clashes. So in this specific case, it did exist. And I can't obviously say whether or not that exists in general. We now have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> On one of your slides, you said you got a minimum of 27 clashes. Uh, oh, yeah. Was that they are 27 students with one clash each, or is it maybe one class and all the students? Yeah, one class so clash? that's uh, no, not necessarily. Um, and that's kind of where the app kind of comes into use um, because you can actually show uh, we so this is kind of just the full data because you can see that 60,000 entries, but you can filter to show clashes only, and then you can see you know what is actually causing the clashes, or which students or which courses specifically, and then you know I've also just given the opportunity to download it as a file, I mean if they need it or if they want to send it through to whoever else needs the data. Thanks, Abi. That was a great presentation. <laughs> Pleasure, Tom. Um, good to see that it came together <laughs> in the end. Um, I wanted to ask about your cost. Um, is yeah. it focused mainly around course clashes, or do you also factor in the number of students doing each of those courses? So in this specific case, it's just kind of a simple case of, you know, each clash is weighted equally, I guess you can say in that sense. Um, so, you know, it could just be that it's one big class, like oh, one big course sorry, contributing to the majority of the clashes. Um, I would assume then that during the optimizing case, you know, if it's a big class that's causing all the clashes, hopefully that would be dealt with, you know, sooner rather than later. But again, you know, like you say, there's there's no waiting on it, looking at maybe a relative participation or relative um, registration to a course could be, you could wait, you know, courses in that sense, and then kind of, I guess, make the cost, the cost function more um, uh, specific or detailed. Great. Um, I just going to check the time. <laughs> uh, OK, I think if it's a short question, I can. <laughs> Might be a long answer. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, why why do you consider uh, the, the individual students are not, you know, specific subject combinations? Because surely there must, there must be uh, like if, say, you become management sciences student, and you never flunk a subject, there will be some in your class that have got the same trajectory in subjects than you do. Um, so do you filter them out or, or what do you do? No, um, that's actually a good uh, uh, suggestion. Um, in my case, I, I didn't, right? I was kind of looking at a quick and dirty approach to know kind of um, more a proof of concept rather than anything, right? Um, I'm not looking for an optimal solution, just a good solution. Um, and in most cases, that's you know kind of way you only what you only need, right? Um, but I guess you know in hopefully you know if I do end up doing my PhD, that's kind of things I will end up looking at, um, kind of get more granular approaches um, to see you know where exactly can we optimize and can we break down the the optimizing strategies to some to kind of enforce optimality, hopefully. You know, in some ways. Great. Thanks, Ibrahim. Nice Thank talk. <laughs> okay. Our last speakers for this session um, are Wasim Gur and Alex Thompson from the University of Cape Town. And they're talking on um, a hypothesized solution to UCT's timetabling problem. So Wasim and Alex are both final year students at the University of Cape Town, currently studying a Bachelor of Business Science, specializing in analytics, and are currently working together to present a solution to the timetabling problem that the University of Cape Town is currently faced with. Both students have a passion for data science and statistics and are excited about the field of operations research and look forward to emphasizing how much of an underrated field of research it is, especially amongst universities in South Africa 
and both students look forward to presenting the work that they're in the progress of completing and almost have completed. So thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I often like wonder where my love for statistics came about. And I think for most of us, the draw to statistics is the logic behind it in terms of decision making, you know, like there's a quantitative approach to problem solving and we understand why things are happening. Now, when we take a look at operations research, it's really is the best of both worlds because you get really the practicality and the problem solving. And as fun as those 10 page proofs are, it really is nice to just implement something that's practical and can be used for the now and for the future. With that being said, I'd like to introduce the topic that Alex and I have both been lucky to be assigned to, and that's that we were tasked in solving the timetabling problem that the stats department at UCT were having. And now this problem might not be large, but it is a problem nonetheless. And as statisticians, obviously, we always trained and taught to think in terms of optimization and efficiency so how could we you know sit back and watch our stats department do something that was anything that wasn't optimal now the stats department takes a very manual approach with regards to course timetabling and venue allocations and the approach i'm talking about is a controlled yet somewhat randomized approach to module allocations to lecturers. Now, when I say controlled and randomized, what's emphasized in the department currently is the ability to teach a model, module and not necessarily the preference of that module being taught by the lecturer. And now we believe that this can lead to a really not, not a low level of teaching, but it can result in a teaching level that can be raised. And we can look at this quote here, which I found in the literature, which says appropriate teaching subject allocation based on preference, expertise and experience is necessary to uphold a high teaching quality and bring job satisfaction to teachers. Now, obviously, we aren't saying that the level of teaching is bad, but we are trying to raise it and be at its best. So after lecturers are randomly assigned their modules based on their qualifications, they then have to assign venues to the modules that they were allocated. And this is done through an external process. And this process often takes weeks to initially just create. Um, and then it's applied through through an external department at UCT, the venues department. And once that's done, it takes a further few weeks just to finalize. So this whole problem really takes about a month or so just before we can even get into the semester and start working on it. Now, two common concerns for this type of problem and why um, the scheduling problem hasn't been implemented in the into the department as yet is computational expense and impracticality of solutions. So Alex and I have both addressed this and we believe that the computational expense is down to the more uh, or the inefficient implementation of modeling or model formulation and the impracticality what we've done is we've created a few different timetables and compared them with each other uh, to allow just not only to check whether solutions are valid and also to check if solutions make sense because there's no use in creating an optimal timetable that schedules all our lessons at eight in the morning when no one really wants to come in at eight in the morning and this allows the department to spend less time on the things that can be automated and more time on things that require more hands-on approach, like deferred exams, registration issues, and perhaps even people wanting to leave the department or enter department uh, at a later time. Um, we've obviously faced many setbacks in this project and I don't think it was designed for us to get a solution within the first month or two and one of the first or the most difficult setbacks we had was the data collection because there was no frame of reference that we had to go with and everything we had to create was from scratch so obviously we made some rookie errors along the way and we might have asked for too many things but I think in the long run as our as we're just starting our careers in operations research, I think it is better to learn uh, now than later. So we combined, uh, com we did a combination of surveys, which included both face-to-face uh, -face and online, um, 
answering of the surveys and we've asked lecturers to rank the three top favorite modules to teach, um, what module, what other modules they could teach, what other modules they are teaching, you know, to avoid any clashes and the number of hours they, they plan on spending on their current, um, on, on the honors class. Then we surveyed students with regards to whether they preferred morning and afternoon classes, uh, as well as what modules they're taking and as well as whether they preferred longer sessions of perhaps two hour, two hour sessions or that, is that me? Okay. I don't know. Um, so whether they preferred a two, one two hour session or a single or two single one hour sessions. And then after that, we we had to find out about the capacities of venues. And as we know, obviously, during the pandemic, we had to adjust. So we wanted to make this adjustment. We wanted to build this sort of adjustment into our model. So we adjusted for venue capacities and we want to pre we want to preference our internal venue so that we can minimize the use of the external department. Now, um, before we go into detail about the approach, I just want to give a brief overview of what it contained. So we split it up into a two-phase and a three-phase problem. If we look at the two-phase problem, I mean the three-phase problem first, uh, the first thing we want to prioritize, uh, which is the first phase, is lecture preferences. So we want most lecturers to be able to teach the module that they desire to teach the most or the second most or at worst the third most. After that we used those results and went on to our second phase which is the timetable allocation uh, and that's regarding students and their preferences to morning and afternoon classes and what we found is most students preferred morning, uh, morning as opposed to afternoon classes. After that, we'd, we'd want to maximize our ven internal venue allocations, like I said previously, and just minimize the use of an external department, because then that just takes time that we don't need. Uh, then if we look at our fa two-phase model, which we'll explain in detail just now, uh, we combined the first two phases of our three-phase model and used a goal programming approach um, to solve it, I mean, to, to formulate it. And after the, after we formulated it, we then um, incorporate the venue allocations in the same way we did the three-phase problem. So for the first phase of the three-phase approach, our aim was to maximize the number of courses that a lecturer teaches that they wanted to teach. So the decision variable that we used was the number of courses that was, or the number of classes per module that was allocated to a lecturer. So what we had to do in the model is we had to make sure that all the classes per module were allocated to the required number of lecturers, which is that top one there. Um, the teachers would only teach what they were capable of teaching for each course, which is the second one. And that we had to make sure that the amount of time that we allocate to the lecturers was in a range of what they could actually teach or were available to teach. So we've introduced a minimum value, which could be zero if they're not required to teach anything or some larger number if they are required to teach something, which is this one. And then also when allocating a lecturer to a module, we set a minimum number of classes that they needed to teach because this was an issue that we came into when we were doing the modeling because some of the lectures were getting allocated to one class which is not beneficial for the lecturer or the students okay so then we move on to the second phase of this approach where we allocate the modules um, to the timetable so the we use the results from the um the first phase sorry how we did this is we created a binary variable where all the lecturers that were allocated to a module, we found when they were all available, and this is the only times that we could allocate the module to the timetable. So what we needed to do for this one is we needed to make sure that the required number of hours were scheduled for each module, and that only one course was scheduled at one time slot, because you can take a combination of any of them if you're an external student from the honors class. Um, and then we had to, uh, well, we had to, um, make sure that the different class structures would be accommodated for on the timetable. So some of the different class structures are one double period, 
or two single periods or even two double periods. So for the double periods over here, we had to make sure that the classes were consecutive because you don't want to split them up. For single period classes over different days, we needed to make sure that there was at least maybe a day in between. So we did this, more, this constraint over there because we wanted to give the students some time to maybe go over the work that they did and prep for their next lecture. And then we did the same for the the two double modules as well. Um, yeah. And then one of the issues that we came into when we were doing this is that all the classes were being allocated consecutively, either in the morning or the afternoon, according or depending on the preference we had. So we introduced another constraint which had a period break between all the classes. So they weren't five hours of consecutive classes. So then this takes us to the third phase of our approach, which is the venue allocation. We try to maximize the use of the internal venues. Um, and we use the results in the from the previous thing, the previous phase, by creating a binary model, a binary variable, sorry, of what time each module was scheduled. So we that's that one up there. And we combine this with the preference of each time slot whether or not the venue was available and if they could accommodate the um, accommodate the class. So only venues that could accommodate a particular class were given a preference weighting for the time slot the class was actually available and when the lecture was actually happening. So for this, we just needed to make sure that all the classes were allocated to a venue, that only one venue was um, allocated at a time slot because we only had one module allocated in a time slot and that if you had consecutive classes that you'd be given the same venue for both classes. Okay and then we moved on to a two phrase approach which we are currently still busy with. Um, it's combining the lecture and the time slot allocation. So we are using all the constraints from the first and second phase of the three phase approach. And we're gonna be doing this using the Chevy Chev um, goal programming vari variant, sorry. In addition to all the other constraints that we used, we adding another one where you pick the required number of lectures that you want per module. And then afterwards we'll be allocating the venues again by trying to maximize the use of the internal venues and it'll be using all the same constraints as the venue model that I showed earlier. So for the coding, we decided to split up the lecture and the model allocation because we wanted to make it as adaptable for the user of the model. Because when we were interviewing or asking the lecturers questions, we found that many of them preferred different class structures. So the idea was that you'd allocate the lecturers to their module and then you could adapt or change how you wanted each module's class structure so it could be more suited towards the lecturer's preference when you created the timetable. And obviously we also want to compare this to the simultaneous approach and see how it differs. Um, the venue allocation, we've split this up from all of this because we don't really see it as an an issue that we're trying to solve because currently we have two internal venues that are usually always available and if your class is too big or it's not available you you just have to book a venue through the venues department. Um, all our coding was done on R. We used the RJLPK package and the RJ sorry the RJ no GLPQ solve LP function. And we try to make this model as adaptable as possible. So the user of it could change any of the lecturer module or venue information. They could add or take away. And just some of the examples of what you could maybe do is just change when a semester when a module was taught, so in which semester or the structure of classes as previously discussed. So we're going to be speaking about the results now. So these are all the modules that the Department of Statistics offers for the stats on a students. I've just abbreviated it for the sake of space on the next few slides. Um, and the results are from the three phase approach because we're still busy coding the two phase approach. So this is the first phase where we allocated the lecturers to the modules. So on the table, you'll be able to see the teachers and then the modules that they were allocated to. 
Um, and then the little tick boxes next to it is just saying which one of the preferences they were actually allocated to. So just looking at teacher five, they don't have any of their preferences it's because they didn't give us any preferences. Um, so about 76% of the lecturers got their first preference. If we exclude teacher five, it would be 81. Any lecturer that was allocated more than one module got their first and second choice. And then only three teachers were given their second or at worst their third um, preference. So looking at the teachers out, teaching hours. So earlier I explained that we had to allocate a certain amount of hours within a given range. For this um, model, we decided to set the minimum number of hours to 10, which could be zero or any other number you want. And we can see from this that all the lectures were allocated a number of hours in their range. And just explaining the maximum amount, we asked the lecturers to give us their maximum amount of hours. So some of them did give it to us and others we others didn't. So we just estimated amount taking the standard 90 hours that's expected of them from the department, minusing the number of hours they spent on the undergrad and the master's courses. OK, and then this is just checking that the number of classes per module was actually allocated to the teachers, which was which did happen. So then this is the timetabling part of the approach. So this is for semester one, the morning in the morning. Over here, we can see that there is like the classes are majority put in the morning and there are period breaks between each and all the double period classes have consecutive sessions. The, we use the, um, the structure that our current honours year is using. So the only class with two single periods is Portfolio Theory or PT. And then just explaining these grey blackout blocks over here. So we have analytic students in our stats um, course and they have another separate module that they do. It's called Strategic Thinking. So we have a TUT over there and a class someday on the Friday. And this is just our seminar. So we try to avoid scheduling any classes there. And then the Friday we left blank so we could work on our project or thesis. Um, and then the afternoon preferences, you see them, they got shifted up um, and all the constraints were kept for this. Then looking at semester two, unfortunately we did get one ATM lecture um, and all the classes have their double periods. They're a day break between the two single ASTA sessions and the two AN or analytics modules. Um, yeah, and then for the afternoon one, you can see all the classes have shifted and the constraints have all been satisfied. So just a note, looking at this semester two afternoon preference and this semester one afternoon preference, there is a gap here at 2 p.m. That is an unofficial lunch break. We did this by lowering the preference weightings for that time. It was initially at one, um, but most of the classes then ended up getting scheduled between four and six, which we didn't think would be favored by students. So we shifted lunch up a little bit, but obviously the person who decides to use this model can change it how they see fit. And then the third phase of the approach, we allocated the venues to all well, the yeah, the venues to the classes. Um, for semester one, the majority of the classes were asked to um, book an external venue, but that was just because the sizes of the classrooms, the classes were too big to be accommodated. The only ones that use internal venues were um, decisioning mod decision modeling, um, likelihood, and ORA. And then for module two or semester two, most of the classes were allocated internal venues with ORA and analytics being asked to book external venues. So looking at this, only the classes that were too big to fit in the internal venues for both semesters had to book externally. Um, and now we're just going to quickly compare the results to the current timetable. So on the left is our model result and on the right is the actual. We picked the morning um, schedules because that's what the, um, the students seem to prefer. As you can see on this, they do look a little bit different. Um, the period breaks but on the actual one are two periods long or none. Um, it also adheres to this, leaving this block out for the strat and the seminar and leaving the Friday day blank for the project work. And then if we move on to semester two, also looks a little bit different again with most of the modules being in the afternoon for the, um, the actual timetable. 
The only issue with the actual one is there are clashes with our strategic thinking courses. And this has become an issue because this lecture over here has now become compulsory and the base one isn't recorded. Um, yeah, so I'm going to back to you. OK, so just to conclude, so what we've done is we've essentially created a model that the department can use and that uh, they can adjust year on year and make the most optimal timetable for their year. And we've also created a database for them. And we, like I said earlier, there was no database for us to use as a framework. So we've created one and it's allowed um, for forward research or for, for moving forward in projects. It's allowed them to, to be able to use it. Uh, as Alex mentioned, we validated using our current timetables. And what we still need to do is obviously complete our second phase model create a shiny application to allow uh, easy implementation and user-friendly implementation of our model. Because like um, Ibrahim said before, not everyone is a, is a professional coder and knows what to do. And our hopes for the project is obviously to be used in the stats department, and not only that, but in the entire department across UCT, and to in incorporate some soft OR. And by that, I mean incorporating some high um, high level optimization in terms of learning ability so not just focusing on teaching ability but learning ability by incorporating psychology and neuroscience uh, and the literature involved in those subjects so if i give an example quickly it's like we all know our attention spans are like rapidly decreasing so maybe restricting classes to 30 minutes and having 30 minute sessions within a two and a half hour window as opposed to a 90 minute class once off might be better so we want to prime the students to not only to learn optimally and prime teachers to teach optimally thank you Thanks, you too. You want You didn't say anything. Um, you mentioned um the software art part. Yeah. So, so one thing that that comes to mind is that perhaps some lecturers are given more preference when they're doing the scheduling. And mm. so, you know, sometimes I suspect that might be an unspoken thing, but you yeah. get um, a bit of priority in your choices. Is is that something? Yeah. That so um, there was a bit of a data discrepancy that we weren't allowed to capture data regarding the preferences or specific time allocations because obviously some lectures are more involved in research and they get preferences to because their teaching hours are so little. So with that case, I think there was an ethical clash between our thoughts of what we wanted the model to be and what the department wanted the model to be. So we just prompted for allowing everyone for an equal um, like equal weighting of preferences. But like we said, it's very adjustable. And the idea is not to be able to give you a final timetable, it's to automate the whole system so that in two minutes, you can start making your final adjustments. Because instead of it taking a month and then a few more weeks to finalize, here it's like our computational time was less than 10 minutes in total. So doing that just, I think, speeds up the process a lot. Yeah. Sure, very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, questions. Um, the session sort of ends it in two minutes, but because there's there are no speakers next, for those who want to leave, you can try and catch the other speakers, or you can stay and ask more questions. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I thought you know it's a really nice honors project, but mm. I think the the issue you mentioned with the soft OR, mm. I think there's some things that one that don't lend themselves to optimization. Mm. And I think the issue here is is the the coherence of the the team. Yeah. So quite a lot of stuff happens by negotiation, and it's yeah. through discussing who wants to teach what that we find out people's priorities or the the issues in a particular year at a particular mm. time. Yeah. And some people take on more work because they really it's their stream of postgraduate students, yeah. or, and they have less undergraduate. So I would say it, it's great. Um, mm but that it needs something alongside which acknowledges the, the human component. Yeah, so what we like thought about that, so we've asked, we've surveyed like teachers this year and we found that there were a few that didn't get to teach 
the um, the ones they wanted. And what we found was actually that those teachers that didn't get to teach the modules that they wanted to teach, those modules were available to teach. So there was probably a miscommunication in the initial discussions, and that obviously needs to take in, be taken into account. But I think for us, the soft OR part, uh, alongside obviously the negotiations and everything, we wanted it to, because initially, if you remember the quote, it says a high level of teaching can be achieved with a schedule, uh, optimized scheduling problem. And what we wanted to do is not only a high level of teaching, but a high level of learning as well. So maybe serving students, asking them what their most pr productive times throughout the day is, what times they usually wake up, that can be incorporated into our model in terms of like if everyone, if 90% of students find that their most productive hours are 10 to 12 and you only schedule for one or two classes a day, you might as well schedule it within that time frame. So taking that sort of a soft OR approach um, is what we aim for, yeah. And then just um, for your point about the postgrad stream, so maybe what we could consider doing is increase the preference weighting for lecturers that want to carry and take these um, students through to their to their masters so they have a higher chance of being allocated that course. So maybe like extra discussions could be had with the lecturers to accommodate for that. Thanks. Thank So, so I've got a, a question. Um, so G GLPK is the underlying uh, integer programming software that you're using to solve this particular formulation. But when you talk about things like um, preferences, right, and trying to find some sort of convex weighting of how those things can be traded off against the efficiency of the timetable, are you not now, now more leaning towards like some sort of multi-objective approach? Um, um, yes, we're going to be doing that in the two-phase approach. So we're going to be using goal programming. Okay, so you're going to do it using goal programming. Yes. There are some very nice, um, uh, yeah, book chat. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, Wait, Rupert, there are mm -hmm. people online that weren't able to hear you, so I'm going to give you the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I um, in the human interaction approach, you, what, what I always find is you, you chat to people and they give you requirements and what they want and what they prefer, and then you do something, they come and they think, oh, I didn't think about that, that never crossed my mind. Um, so when you generate a schedule and people say, oh, actually, I can't do that, I have to be in this time, can you adapt your how, or it is possible to adapt, but just maybe a recommendation in your sort of evolution of this, this software application is that you, you can come in and you can lock down periods and then rerun the program immediately. So it's, so you know, have your, 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 your th Fridays blocked off or your Monday mornings blocked off. Oh, this lecture must happen at that time. So the flexibility, have you thought about the flexibility of being inflexible by coming in and saying, Okay, we've spoken to a lot of people there. The lecturers have said, okay, they're happy. They've negotiated. He can have that slot and then rerun your program around locking down certain certain windows. I suppose we could um, fix it um, in the code, I think. Yeah, you can. We haven't considered that yet, but I think we should definitely look into that, especially for further application of what we're going to do. Thank you for the suggestion. And, um, also, like what I would say to that is that's more of the finalizing part that's done like human intuition and things like that so it like like i said earlier it's not to provide a final model but it's to provide like the good foundation and then the the intuition and the swapping of time periods that can be changed because you'll have the timetable and you'll have the undergrad and postgrad timetable so you'll be able to adjust it within the department yeah yeah yeah, yeah, it, our model does allow for like the adjustments of the weightings per like for the modules and that stuff. Maybe we just need to implement it per lecturer. And that's the only thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Very nice. Thank Thanks, Wasim. Thank you. Thank you.